Hello and welcome to another Soccer to the Max. As uh, we are one poor person short here because Rachel McCrigger had some school stuff to get to and she could not be with us tonight. But at least I am not here by myself. Of course, I'm your host, Sean Garmer, and here with me, Mr. Eric Watkins. Ah. Uh. Longing for the days of graduate school and a better appreciation of March Madness. When you were in the thick of it and you thought it would just all lead to these awesome dreams you were going to (laughs) accomplish. Oh, the delusions. Hey, at least uh, Rachel is doing a heck lot more uh, without the graduate school than I think a lot of people have. Uh, with it so this is true very true major props to her for all the things she's already gotten herself into at the uh tender age that she's already i mean you know she has a whole lot left ahead of her uh and hopefully she gets that paper done and she'll be with us on the thursday show which will be looking at uh two big games the sporting kc and monterey uh, CONCACAF Champions League game and the U.S. Women's National Team uh, game that takes place on Thursday too. So uh, we'll be getting to talk about those. But right now we've got uh, MLS Week 5 action to talk about in our nine things. And, well, this week will be three teams because Rachel's not here with us. And we've got uh, a few international things to discuss as CONCACAF starts rounding things out with their important uh, tournaments happening uh, very soon. And, of course, the U.S.-Chile game, which by now it's kind of old news, so we're not going to sit here and uh, talk about it way too much like we would have had we done the show uh, the night that the game happened. Uh, But still, uh, worth noting that Greg Berhalter still undefeated as U.S. coach so far. A 1-1 draw. U.S. looked pretty good in the first 20-25 minutes. Helped out that uh, Pulisic got that goal in like the fourth minute. And then the defense started showing cracks. And then you had the Pulisic injury. And that sort of seemed to take things down a notch by a lot. Like you can see the difference in the team when Pulisic is not there all of a sudden. Yeah, and, and everything was very, very... Well, I can't even say fluid, but it was pretty close. That early goal, the Chilean defensive back line was a bit of a shambles in that phase of play, and through Pulisic, we were able to take advantage, but... It took us that same amount of time and even a few minutes after to get ourselves very steady at the back because Chile really down the flanks tried to exploit us the most in the first half. But once we settled down, it was easier to really kind of play for the stalemate. Yeah, certainly. And I think they they were lucky that Chile didn't score another goal on them the way the defense was I mean especially I just think it's your the reason you're 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 bringing in like a B team sort of uh you know Sands Pelusic and Bradley I mean you, you couldn't play with your your other main two because McKinney got hurt in the previous game Tyler Adams they were kind of taking him off as a precaution uh he uh played really well for Leipzig on the weekend again so he's He's doing his his thing in Germany still, but yeah, it just looked like, especially with Gonzalez and Miazga, they had issues. Uh, Gonzalez is, I think, still trying to. He's doing okay in Mexico, but he's he's not been himself. Um, and Jossie Sardes had that one chance that just didn't work for him, and he's still doing his thing. But yeah, I just it didn't feel like the defense was. Up to snuff. Bradley was okay, but he was also giving away passes a lot. And 
there was just not a lot of, like you said, that fluidity that was there was gone pretty quick. So. Yeah, and, and it, there was, n- normally with these matches, even though you have like this B-side together, you still see at least somewhat pattern of attack. You have like that different overall strategy. And I understand maybe they were trying to go for a more tiki taka approach, but I didn't sense it. It was just like trying to go for individual matchups rather than going for particular passes. And that didn't work. Yeah, I think what did help is in the second half, uh, Berhalter made a defensive switch. He put uh, Will Trap in there to kind of clog up the middle a bit more. He gave them a bit more play uh, towards the end. Uh, that's also where Zardo's got that one chance and everything else. I think just you had you had the Chile getting wide on them. And mm-hmm. the goal that happened was just a total, like, defensive breakdown, just a bunch of rebounds, and then eventually it goes in. Uh, that really shouldn't have happened had the defense just been more up to snuff. But, you know, again, when Michael Bradley was probably your best player, uh, you know, once Pulisic went down, and he was giving away passes still, I think this shows you the kind of game that, this team was not just the entire team was not having a a good day at all. And, but I I will say, I think it's good on them to be scrappy. Right. And, and still come away with a, with a draw against a, I wouldn't say totally a team Chile, but you had some of the stars out there like Arturo Vidal and, you know, yeah, there were some really signs of talent, especially with Chile kind of trying to rebuild and do things themselves, suffering like similar fate going back to 2018, like the last World Cup. So I get it, and maybe that scrappiness will help us as we go into not just the Gold Cup, but qualifying for this cycle, because... Now, instead of relying on, you know, top talent and names and this and that, you're getting a little bit of that MLS and other European-style kind of grittiness to them. Yeah, I think, again, we got to look at it like there was no John Brooks, who was terrific in the last game. You know, Will Trapp didn't you know, play until that second half. You know, Pelusis went out, which, again, changed the the entire game for them because he was there their player that made a huge difference. Uh, I don't think anybody would have done that chip over the keeper that he did that was on that, on the pitch for the U.S. that day. And, uh, you know, no Tyler Adams, no Weston McKinney. Ariola wasn't uh, playing very well. Um, You know, I think overall just the B team went out there. The B team was managed to still hang on, and I think that's something to commend them for, but I think when you're, th- this is the caliber of team you're going to play, you know, you, Ecuador, I think, is nowhere near the Ecuador's of the past, so Ecuador, to me, is more like a really good CONCACAF team right now, mm-hmm. whereas I think Chile's when you get into the Combo Bowl teams, and even with Chile missing some players, that was still a pretty good Chile team, and... That those signs show that they still need to make that step up still. And yeah. we'll see. Yeah, we have a... I can't say a long way to go, but it's still a significant ways to go, and I don't know. Time will only tell now that we're also getting into the... CONCACAF Nations League how much that's really going to help us but at least we know now where we stand there's signs of progress but we know how gap how really big the gap was at one point yeah certainly and yeah I will certainly see if that helps or not 
Uh, you also got the Gold Cup coming up as well. And we're going to talk about both those things right now because both of the fields for those two cups, leagues, whatever you want to call them, uh, are set. Um, the draw for the Gold Cup is not done yet, but the field is set. Uh, the one for the Nations League is done, and we know who's going to be in the uh, League A, which is the league that the U.S., Mexico, um, you know, the big clubs are in. So here's how uh, things broke down after the draw here uh, for the U.S. They are going to play Canada and Cuba. Uh, somehow they always get stuck with Cuba at some point. I wonder how many players are going to be missing by the time it turns. It, it's time for Cuba to play the U.S. Uh, Canada and Cuba are going to play their set with each other first. Uh, so that means the U.S. will still be playing some friendlies. Uh, and then I think the U.S. will start uh, playing uh, some of the teams, or one of the two teams uh, after that. It's what, September or October and... November is when mm -hmm. this is going to start. How it's going to line up since we're in League A, which mm -hmm. all of your groups are triangular, there's going to be three match days, one in each month. As you go down to some of the lower leagues where you have quadrangular groups, it's going to be two match days in each of those months. Right. So you have... Yeah, like I said, U.S., Canada, Cuba, you have Mexico, Panama, and Bermuda. So um, Mexico kind of got the roughest team out of that second group. Uh, but then they got a Bermuda uh, to round out their, their third team. Uh, Honduras probably has the roughest group with the Trinidad and Tobago and depend, uh, Tobago, depending on you know, who they bring, they can be very dangerous. And Martinique, who are always one of those um, Caribbean teams you kind of got to take seriously. And Costa Rica uh, got IT or Haiti, sorry, and Curaçao, which um, Haiti is always, again, one of those anomaly teams of, like, who they bring. Uh, sometimes they can be absolutely bad, and sometimes they can be pretty surprising. Akutosal was one of those teams, I think, in the last Gold Cup everybody thought was going to do uh, really good, and uh, that didn't happen. But still, uh, we'll see how that goes when we hit September, October, November. But looks like so far the U.S. gets that. Uh, they get the, I guess, sort of rivalry with their, their neighbors to the north in Canada, but for the men, this has not been a rivalry. This has been the U.S. dominating the women. It's a bit more of a rivalry. Uh, but still kind of interesting uh, where this goes. Obviously, the two, the team that wins each group goes into a, a knockout where they play each other, and then the... Obviously, if you're in your group winners, they automatically, there's no league they can promote to, but they stay in that league, and then obviously you can become the champion of that league if you win the little knockout phase. The more important thing is to try to not be the last in your group because then you get relegated to uh, group B or, or group C even, and then the group B... Yeah, same thing with the uh, League B and League C. The winners of those groups get to uh, promote to the next league higher than them for next year. So it's a neat little concept. Again, I'm a bit skeptical about how this is going to really work for CONCACAF. I think this is great for like the Caribbean nations, right? But mm -hmm. I don't know this is that great for the U.S.'s and Mexico's and Costa Rica's of the world that need that higher caliber of competition. Yeah, the biggest country this helps is Canada because Canada yep. is going to be on a very big stage and they will be able to grow and showcase their emerging talent. And this is going to be great timing along with the new Canadian Premier League. But with your big nations, as you said, with the U.S., 
this could potentially hurt with Mexico. This could potentially hurt. Even with Costa Rica, this could potentially hurt. Because we're doing this, and okay, it's an easy path. You know you're getting your wins, and you're helping yourselves within the continent. But outside of this, I know nothing is a lock. But if you're talking for your first Final Four, you can already pencil in as favorites three teams. And then Group C is just wide open. And odds are, what, you think they're just going to be little more than whipping boys from the Final Four itself? Probably. So I know what CONCACAF was doing modeling this off of UEFA, but UEFA is a deeper confederation Right. With a lot of talent, with a lot of teams, even the smaller ones, and those smaller nations are going to get an even a bigger boost within Europe than our Caribbean nations would get a boost with this league here. So it could have been at least very least thought out a little bit more. Yeah, I mean, there's not a lot you can do when that those lower teams are what they are. Mm-hmm. Um. You know, there's not a whole lot. It just you're it, some of the interesting, you know, League B teams like a Jamaica and El Salvador. Um, if they were in here uh, instead of you know some of the ones that are in League A right now, um, and presumably you'd think they would be at the top, so group of of League B. Uh, then maybe next year it's a bit more competitive. As far as, um, you know, you'd think Jamaica is going to top that group with a Guyana, uh, Guyana, Antigua, Barbuda, and Aruba. But who knows, maybe Guyana surprises since they actually qualified for the Gold Cup. Uh, Nicaragua, you would, I don't know, they, they're so up and down. It's interesting because Nicaragua is not a team you would think of as a powerhouse in CONCACAF previously. They're ones that do things sometimes, but not always. Also, Guatemala's been suspended. They're one of the ones that you kind of always look at as well, and they're with the Honduras and El Salvador and um, Jamaicas of the world that that are usually important there. Um, they're all the way in Group C because of them being suspended previously, so uh, it'll take them a little bit to come back up. But yeah, th- this is going to be... I think this is going to be a more fun... Like you said, like we, we've talked about for this, the nations, they don't always get a lot of publicity, right? Mm-hmm. Or those, like, the League B teams, when they get into League A next year and get to play the quote-unquote big teams in CONCACAF, I think that's going to be a lot more interesting. I think this year is what you're looking ahead to more is the Gold Cup because... It's the first year that it's 16 teams and not 12. And it's also going to be hosted in three different countries. So you have the U.S. hosting most of the games. Costa Rica is going to be doing a doubleheader uh, for group games in Group B. And then you have group games in Group C that are going to be in a yet-announced Caribbean country. So that's kind of neat. Do you like this? What they're doing? Like personally, around? personally, I do because if you're going to make it like a big kind of barnstorming tour, as they have a whole bunch of matches played throughout sites in the U.S., like they do, give it to some of these countries. I like Costa Rica, who have more than proven their worth. Give them a couple matches. You've had it in Mexico before. Maybe Canada, or even if you want to give a little bit of a boost, maybe, I know it wouldn't be for this year, but for the next tournament, maybe uh, places like Puerto Rico, or places like that. Give these smaller teams, or smaller nations, a chance to host some of the higher profile matches, because a few of them deserve it. It could be helpful. And this could also bring that showcase to what you're trying to do throughout the Caribbean. Yeah, I think 
what I'd like to see is eventually have one gold cup that doesn't have anything in the United States. Um, I know that that's going to be really hard for CONCACAF and for the U.S. to do itself at some point. Uh, to not have that want to, oh, we got to have it in the U.S. because they have the best stadiums and whatever. I mean, Mexico has enough stadiums to be able to host the whole Gold Cup by themselves. And I think you mm-hmm. should give them that opportunity. Um, I think Canada obviously has enough stadiums to be able to do it as well. Uh, mm-hmm. I feel like they have the ability to to do it. Now, I think at some point you would have to use one of those three along with a Costa Rica or an Honduras or um, – you one of the Caribbean countries, like, but more than what they're doing, like not just a double header, like maybe you yeah. have an entire group is played in the Caribbean or an entire group is played in Costa Rica or Honduras or whatever. I know that that puts, and that's why I don't really necessarily want that because that puts that group at a disadvantage, right? From the, you know, because some of those fields in some of those countries are awful. You know? Well. Um. What CONCACAF could do if they really want to make an investment, they can kind of borrow a tactic from the World Baseball Classic. Now, what the World Baseball Classic does is they have their different stages, first round hosted different countries throughout the world. Then the second round, a couple of different countries, and they have and even the United States, and then the finals in the United States. So what you could possibly do, CONCACAF gives some sort of financial backing to help improve some of the fields and stuff throughout the Caribbean, along with, okay, host a group or two different Caribbean nations or what have you, then once you get to the knockout stages, that you could put in Canada or all in Mexico, or all in the U.S., etc. Something along those lines. Yeah, I'd love for it to be, at some point, I I don't know, I wonder if this is going to be at the point where we're old and gray, of the Gold Cup is kind of like the Copa America, where it's all in that country, and you don't do that, where... You know, it's like, you know, Copa America just bounces around the 10 different countries. There's no yeah. bidding. There's no whatever. It just, that's just how it is. It bounces around the 10 countries because they're all big enough. They're all, I mean, Venezuela's terrible in a terrible state right now, but we don't have to worry about Venezuela hosting for a long time. So No, because uh, thankfully they had the foresight to go to it in alphabetical order. Right. But what I'm saying is most of the other countries... They are their own footballing nations. They have enough stadiums where you can do that. Mm -hmm. Um, Granted, they're not all, again, they're not all. Usually the national stadium is great in Bolivia, but then you go to other places of Bolivia, it's not necessarily uh, to that standard. But still, it's nothing like, say, going to... Let's have Bermuda and Martinique host the Gold Cup. I mean that that's going to be a whole different level, you know. So, but I would like to see that. I I would like to see like a maybe a Honduras and Costa Rica get to host the entire Gold Cup one time. And it's not oh we have to include United States or we have to include Mexico or we have to include Canada. Mm-hmm. Because if not, this is going to be awful. Like, Yeah, you know. it, it, and that would make a lot of sense. Yes, the U.S. could host it by itself. Yes, Canada can. Yes, Mexico can. But get together with your Central American and Caribbean nations or neighbors and say, all right, which two or which three, who can you get together We'll help you out with a little bit of the infrastructure, but what can you do and what can you know so that way you could combine and host this tournament in like a joint bid? I would love for that to happen. 
but it depends on are the people at the top willing to put their money where their mouth is. Because without that, it's a non-starter. Yeah, exactly. Concast's got to help out. We'll see. Maybe this thing with having Costa Rica host a doubleheader and the Caribbean nation host a doubleheader works out, and then the next one, they can keep progressing and progressing until we do have that happen. But I guess you've got to ha- accept these baby steps for now and, and hope it all goes well. Yeah. At least they're starting somewhere, which is always positive. Exactly, and let's, uh, speaking of positives, there are some first-time teams here in uh, the Gold Cup for 2019 with the expanded field, and that's always a pretty cool feeling. Like, you know, Copa America, that's, that usually doesn't happen unless the, one of the invited teams has never been there because it's always the same 10 teams. It, it's been, all, that's one of the cool things about the Euros expanding is seeing some of these teams that never made it before, like in Iceland, and they progress as far as they did, you know, and you still have that with the 12 team field with Gold Cup because some of these Caribbean teams just, nobody knows what to expect from them. So they just surprise you. Um, But with the expansion of uh, four more teams, now you get a, uh, Bermuda and Guyana getting to be in for the first time ever, you know, and uh, they finished in the top 10 of the 34 team CONCACAF Nations League qualifying. So they got to become uh, two of those teams in here. Nicaragua beat out Barbados uh, in order to uh, get in. So the whole field is now set. Like I said, they've just got to figure out the actual draw. But it's uh, it's still going to be cool just to see how these teams all stack up against each other. But it's the, the six uh, hexagonal teams that, that were in the hex for the 2018 uh, qualifying. Mexico, Costa Rica, Panama, Honduras, United States, and Trinidad and Tobago. Which is interesting because Canada was always a automatic qualifier previously and they actually had to qualify this time uh they made it in along with haiti martini curacao bermuda cuba guayana jamaica nicaragua and el salvador so interesting field here for uh this this gold cup are you do you like the the addition of the four extra teams I mean, obviously, it makes the knockout round easier to deal with now, but and and, I, and getting these extra, you know, Caribbean teams in. I really do because for the longest time, especially for Caribbean qualifying, they had to go through their own like tournaments, uh, Copa Uncaf and the CAFU, like the Caribbean Cup, and even within a lot of times those tournaments would be hard to schedule, especially for the Caribbean Cup. There are teams up and down, just like that. So I'm all for not just the qualifying, but okay, let's make it 16. That way, those extra group matches are going to be some good dogfights, and you do have teams starting to trickle in who could really build themselves on a bigger stage. Also, besides bonus is Canada well you've been improving steadily but now you really have to earn it yeah certainly Uh, they got to earn that spot Uh, we'll be interested to see how this goes on with 2021 now where the Nations League will be the way that this entire process is going to be figured out there won't be uh, World Cup qualifying, and you know that's also going to figure out World Cup qualifying as well. Um, so, yeah, it's going to be fun how this uh, all goes out as as we get into. Obviously, the important thing is for the U.S. You win, you don't have to do the playoff for the uh, who gets in the Confederations Cup if that's still going to be a thing because they're still. Uh, Gianni Infantino is still trying to scrap that in favor of a 24-team Club World Cup. 
Still stupid, but that's just and me. And now he's gotten teams to buy into that. Oh, sweet so... Christ, no. Don't. I've had enough bad news this week. Don't tell me that. No. He's gotten some of the UEFA teams to buy into it, so. Oh, frick. Uh, of course, of well, course, UEFA's going to buy into no, it. No, they, they were really opposed to it at first. And I think he's just he's just kept, you know, with that positive mentality that he has of, ah, if it happens, oh, well, if it doesn't, whatever. And he keeps just trying to talk them into it. And some teams are buying in, but we'll see because, you know, as much as uh, sometimes the Confed Cup can be a headache, it is kind of cool for that country and, I mean, I don't know about Qatar, but for that country to kind of see what, have a little bit of a precursor to what it will be like when the World Cup is there, you know, have that little mini tournament, you get to see some of these teams a year before, mm-hmm. that thing. I've always liked it. I thought it was a good idea from the start. I know FIFA seems to kind of, I don't think it, obviously, a 2014 Club World Cup would bring in a hell of a lot more money than no. an 18 Confed Cup would. So that's well, part of the well, reason why. Well, the, the, the reason why, and this would be a combination of two tournaments, because they're trying to figure out two different things. One of the ideas is to have the Club World Cup, which is traditionally hosted in either japan or the united arab emirates since it's in december anyways have that in cutter to replace when they would have the confederations cup and then have the confed cup in another asian country i don't mind that but the whole idea of the 24 team club world cup is to scrap the annual club world cup And scrap the Confederations Cup altogether. And I think logistically, a 2014 Club World Cup, to do it right, how you would have qualifying and everything through those tournaments, it wouldn't, not necessarily, not only not be fair. Yeah, and it's not like those countries' Champions Leagues or Copa Libertadores is going to go away, so now they're playing even more games. mm Mm-hmm. You know? And that's and, why it, and that's why the Club World Cup is set the way it is. So for your UEFA Champions League and Copa Libertadores winners, you only have to play two matches, and then right. for your other nations, you get three, maybe four. And I would rather tweak that than completely overhaul it and get rid of it. I would like to see it played other parts of the world who could handle it because. Even if you're sticking with Asia, you easily can, but right, no. Yeah, it's just, that's a whole different can of worms, and I don't know. I mean, I, I think at some point I could see it happening because money talks, and, you know, they have all these freaking uh, preseason tournaments now that mean nothing, but again, it's all about money. Mm-hmm. I could see Infantino eventually convincing enough teams that it would just be like, oh, whatever, let's do it. But, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Well, for right now, that's still in the well, let's see if it happens stage, but we'll just uh, have to, to wait, I guess. Yeah. Uh, if it comes down to it, I have ideas about, okay, since you're doing this anyway, here's how people would tolerate it, but we'll cross that bridge when we get there. And finally, before we get to the uh, MLS stuff, uh, Fox, we should, probably should have mentioned this on the last show, but Fox named their broadcast crew for the Women's World Cup uh, happening uh, really soon here in June. Um a lot of mixed thoughts on this. Um, I don't know why there is any hate at all for J.P. Della Camera because he's great. I know people wanted John Strong, and that's fine. Uh, he's stuck on MLS duty. And, you know, J.P. is a very, very experienced uh, broadcaster. Uh, 
comes from radio background. He, this dude knows what he's doing. Uh, he's one of been been one of the champions of soccer, even when um, it, we were in the dark days of like Dave O'Brien and stuff doing World Cups. So, um, you know, for him to still uh, be doing great and be that American voice, and of course, Ali Wagner is fantastic. So good to know that she's on the uh, big main crew. Um, Derek Ray is also here, and he's awesome as always, and he'll be uh, there with the Daniel Slayton, a former U.S. Women's National Team defender. And uh, the rest is kind of interesting here. Glenn Davis is back with Angela Hookley's. And then uh, you get Jen Hildreth. You get two teams of all women with Jen Hildreth and Kendra de St. Alban uh, and Lisa... Blyton and Cat Whitehill. Um, I know a lot of people were complaining also about Alexi Lawless being on the crew. Uh, that, you know, they want an all female representation. Rob Stone's still hosting as well during the day, so uh, you're not getting all female representation most of the time anyway, because he's still going to be the one throwing the questions out there. Kate Abdo's doing the World Cup tonight and all that kind of stuff. Uh, she'll probably be also host on days where Rob has other things to do. Uh, remember, Gold Cup is also going on at the same time, so uh, that's also something that uh, John Strong is probably stuck doing. Is they probably want him on Gold Cup so that you don't have like the total B team doing Gold Cup stuff, you know? Um. Uh. I think, uh, you know, you get, I should mention, Heather O'Reilly, uh, Christy Pierce-Rampone, Ariana Hanks, Kelly Smith, who's awesome. I always enjoy her on these. Um, just, I don't know, what do you think about, I don't really have any problems with everybody that got chosen. I feel like everybody that got chosen has earned their spot. Uh, and yeah. what do you think? What? Fox did to me was great. You have a lot of the big name familiar faces that we're used to seeing with Fox men's and women's coverage, but they're getting that same feeling how they approach the men's game, getting a lot of champion like players, very experienced veterans who most of John Q public doesn't really know but they get to see and can get to know them off the pitch and behind the mic in front of the camera. I think that's fantastic. You're still going to get that level of depth and knowledge, very capable. So it's like, what's really wrong? I think for a venture like this for Fox, it was a fantastic move and a great crew assembled. Yeah, I'm glad that they... uh got an Australian player on here with Kate Gill because you'd expect Australia is going to uh, do well in this World Cup. Um, you know, Ariana Hinks is back again, like I mentioned. They got a second English uh, person with uh, Iniola Aluko as well, you know. So, I, I, it's not just all U.S. Women's National Team and a few people. I mean, it seems no. that they went after... You know, a lot of these are known people that we've seen. We saw at the uh, the previous the 2015 World Cup coverage. So it's not it's not completely uh, new. Uh, you're switching out some U.S. Women's National Team uh, players for more, uh, I guess, recently retired blood instead of you know way more previously retired blood. Um, you know. I just, I think this is fine. I I think we'll see on the broadcast teams how they do, but I think the people that are crying out for, oh my God, we had to have all women all the time. This is the women's World Cup. No men allowed. Like I think that that's really really stupid. Um, I I think that's also a vocal minority. I think I don't think that's everybody. Um, I get it that not everybody likes Alexi Lawless, right? I'm the first one to go that. I don't think he's great at what he does he's obviously there to stir the pot Mm -hmm. um but i also don't think that he just that's his only thing right he's not 
it's not like when you have some of these like non players that get to be in boosts and that's all they do. Um, Alexi is was for his time was a pretty good defender. Uh, he got to go, you know, play across Europe, which at a time when you weren't seeing that happen much, and you know he was an MLS GM. Yes, he didn't last long as an MLS GM. But still, like, the dude is opinionated. He he has a good voice. He he knows what he's doing. And, you know, I think when he gives analysis, he does it pretty well. So uh, I think you need to blame the system more in Fox and not less. I mean, he was much better at ESPN because ESPN kind of reined him in, right, and had him more focused. But we have to remember Fox is – Really being into the Raw Raw USA, I don't expect anything different here. They're going to have Alexi Loss on because he's the huge champion for that, along with Rob Stone. And also, I think, you know, they're going to want that sort of American voice leading the coverage. Mm-hmm. You know, Kate Abdo's got the accent. So um, that's just the way Fox goes. I think you got to remember that in s- some stages that that's the way Fox is. Um, we can complain about that all day long, but. You know, yeah. Well, we'll see well, when they announce Gold Cup coverage. I am kind of upset to no Fria, no Fiore, but I imagine that he's on Gold Cup duty. So. Yeah, they're saving him for Gold Cup, and he'll bring a lot more of that energy, especially since you're getting a lot of those Central American teams, which would be great. But keep in mind this, when everybody talks about Fox, the reason Fox and ESPN are completely different, you said it yourself, ESPN, they rein their people in. It is much more that corporate feel of sports, and a lot of times it can be a little bit of an echo chamber. Whereas with Fox, if you're good or if you have opinions that they can work with and everything, they will run with it. So they're yeah. going to have people who are going to be that opinionated and it's going to make for a lot of times much better coverage even than espn Uh, i don't know about that i would say it makes much for much more biased coverage um towards the u.s because i think the espn coverage is a lot more fair well for for this particular instance yes because the fox is trying to cater to a u.s audience because their international presence is nowhere near what ESPN's international presence is. They yeah. built it that way. Whereas with Fox, okay, you have it here, some places in South America, Australia, but outside of that, ESPN is top dog. Right. And that's true as well. Just, uh, you know, just remember this is what they're aiming at and we'll just uh, have to see it when we get there. I think it'll be fine though. I think people are just overstating it for a while, but we'll get to get more into that when the summer rolls around. And once they release the gold cup coverage as well, of course I'll probably be watching a lot more when you see on for that, but uh, we'll see. We'll see what happens there. Let's get on to MLS here. As we got to round out the show, uh, a lot more international stuff than I thought we were going to have had we done this show not today. But, hey, that's how the cookie crumbles sometimes. And like I said, we got more stuff to discuss on Thursday. So our MLS nine things and three teams. First thing, though, Alejandro Pozuelo, welcome to MLS, sir. (laughs) <laughs> what a debut for this guy. A Panenka goal in the run of play. My God, that that goal, that second goal for him was absolutely amazing. Like one of the, It will be one of the goals of the year. I, I can't imagine I, a lot out there is going to top that. Um, I don't know how you can, because that's something you really only see on penalties. Seeing that, it's like, Physically, how could he get himself in position? I was, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean. no words. I mean, obviously, Javinko did a hell of a lot for Toronto, but 
what a grab so far for for the folks in the Toronto front office to bring in Pozuelo. His first game is this. And uh, he was just all over the pitch, just making things happen, uh, playing well with Jonathan Osorio. As uh, you mentioned here, he he put in a nice ball for Josie Altador to score on the one assist that he got. And yeah. And, and yeah, I kind of think Toronto's back now, right? I mean, and this is what I was saying. I mean, yes, NYCFC has been at times a bit shaky, and but this one was a four nil, and four nil is still four nil the way they did it. I really think with this, they've gotten starting to get over the Giovinco loss, bringing in the right. I think Toronto's back on the upswing, and they could be another one of those dangerous teams as we get further into the season. And actually, considering... I mean, Toronto's played two less games than some of the teams, but they're still the only team in the East that is actually truly undefeated. Like They haven't drawn a game. They've got three wins out of three, uh, nine points, and they're only a point behind D.C. and Columbus right now, and they have... There are two games in hand so far. So, you know, I think you definitely have to watch out for Toronto. And if Pozuelo winds up being this for most of the games uh, this season, uh, watch out. Watch out with Toronto. After a lot of people were wondering, oh, my God, what kind of team are we uh, getting here? Uh, After, you know, last year... You know, they won the championship the year prior. They came out and we just were not the same team. Obviously, fire under them. And right now, this is this is working out good for them. It's when you had a great season like Toronto did. At the time, an MLS record 69 points. Then, between that, what happened in Champions League... It creates that sort of a hangover because you put a lot of your energy into finishing the job after a great regular season. That hungover really laid with Toronto throughout the bulk of last year. Now that hangover is gone, the pressure's kind of off because that championship is still fresh in fans' minds. So it's like, okay, now we're in a position to where we can go and do it again. We've already climbed all sorts of mountains. Now we can just play our way, get our team, make a run the best way we see fit. Whatever happens, happens. And that's now showing up on the pitch. Certainly. And we go from one team, the previous champion, to the previous champion, Atlanta United, once again. Just... I mean, they got a goal in this time and all, but still didn't look very good. They are dead last in the East right now. They are tied for the worst start ever of a defending champion in MLS. In its in the league's history, mm-hmm. tied with a two thousand since 2009. I mean, it's just... Not good. Frank DeBoer is also just not making uh, great decisions uh, for the lineup. They were actually sort of playing well. Uh, you know, they beat Monterey even. And then they he kind of started tinkering again, and they lost the flow. Just, I get it, early season woes, you know, championship hangover, losing a Miguel Amiron like that. But, man, just... Listen, Frank DeBoer hasn't won, I think I saw something like Frank DeBoer hasn't won a league game, and if you go back all the way to the Premier League for, like, I don't know how long now, and it's, I, I'm starting to wonder if these DeBoer out signs are not out of the question at this point. Uh- like, if you look at what tactically in has gone on, under Frank DeBoer versus 
What happened tactically in the setup under Tata Martino? Atlanta fans, they would fly to Mexico City. They would go in reverse and cross the border themselves by any ways necessary to bring Martino back because that was a man who knew he what kind of talent he had and how to really maximize everybody. Not just Joseph Martinez, not just Al Neron. He got something out of everybody, and there was a lot of cohesion. DeBoer, it seems like to me, he's just, he knows he has talent, but it's like a dartboard. Throwing things up and seeing what works. And when you're winless now in four league matches, you can't do that with the dartboard. You can do that in preseason. You can do that in camp, but you've got to get to a point where you figured it out. I don't know if the war is going to get to that point. And if this winless one goes five, six, seven, eight matches, his clock should be ticking. Yeah, I mean, you're you're not wrong. It's just, we're talking about the defending champion here. We're mm-hmm. talking about a team that still has a lot of talent. Uh, you know, you still have Joseph Martinez up there. I mean, it's just, it's amazing to me, the yeah. stark difference. Now, granted, look, Tata Martinez is a fantastic uh, tactician. He knows how to put his team out there. He goes out there and attacks. I mean, look at um, what Mexico did to that same Chile team that the U.S. Had. They they whooped him, you know, put three goals on him. I just, mm-hmm. um, you know, I, I think... Yes, you can call it being spoiled if you're DeBoer, but at some point you've got to look at yourself and go, how, look at look at that tape. Look at, how did you get, how did they get that talent moving? You need to figure this out. Obviously, you can't put your team out the same way. You're not the same guy. You can't expect the same thing to happen there, but you've got to yeah. be able to capture some of that magic. Yeah, you've got your imprint that you can put on it. That's fine. Every manager, every individual has that imprint. But you've also got to realize you've got almost everybody on what was in the regular season. Had it not been for the Red Bulls, they would have tied Toronto's record with 69 points. And the Red Bulls somehow got 71, but in the playoffs, Red Bulls are going to Red Bull. So, you got this team that's just propelled and steamrolled. You know it's there. You know how the previous guy did it. You've got to find a way to, you don't have to copy his style, but you've got to mesh that with yours somehow. If you can't get that to work, then you've really got to question yourself as a manager. Certainly. And you talk about a manager that's being questioned right now. Of course, he didn't help himself by uh, discussing uh, some of those questions. Uh, The other team at the bottom of the other conference, San Jose, the Earthquakes, are also winless on the season so far. And Matias Almeida, who comes with a winning track record as a player, as a coach with Chivas, he is obviously just doing... He inherited a terrible team in San Jose. A team that that won, what, four games last year in total. In total. And just, um, you know, I think right now, just telling this fan base it's a four-year plan, have patience, follow the process... I don't think they want to hear that right now. No, because this is a problem with rebuilding plans. I've seen this across sports. Philadelphia 76ers, trust the process. Well, now that's starting to work to some effect. The New York Giants in the NFL back in the 70s and 80s, they had a five-year rebuilding plan that lasted almost two decades. People are very, very sensitive to this. 
you say it's a four year plan, but does that mean you have to go counting last season five years leading up to what? Maybe mediocrity? Maybe hovering around that red line decision day? No. San Jose fans, especially with their tradition and their history, they expect more than that. Even if you had given them two years, they would have questioned you a little bit, but they would have wanted to see what's going on. You're doing this and giving it that long of a time frame? Mm Mm-mm. Wrong place, wrong time. Honestly, for me, I think when he says something like, I'm looking for a style of play, even if they scored 10 goals, I'd have the same mentality because I like a certain style of soccer. Uh, we're trying to give our current players confidence. It's never easy to change the system. It's a whole different system. And as time goes, we're going to get out of this one that we're in. He's, of course, talking about the man-marking system that he uses. And listen, I think it's... I think part of it's just he wants to get through this year, get rid of the guys that he doesn't care for and try to get in the ones that he does. And if he, if the management has patience for that, great. I think at some points they know that the team they inherited isn't uh, great on all levels. And... There's truth to be said for that, but also there's something to be said about the manager needs to figure out the squad that he has and try to play to the best of their ability, right? Like, you got to do the best of what you got. Exactly. You can't just force them to play a certain system. No, you have to merge things in. These take time. And at the same time, you can't go backwards. Yeah, a six or seven win Earthquakes team won't make fans happy, but there's improvement. If you're making these sweeping changes, using the bulk of the season, potentially, and you wind up with, what, two or three wins and maybe ten points? Yeah, fans are going to come after you justifiably with pitchforks. Yeah, I... I wonder if, you know, it's just one of these where Almeida's kind of just trying to buy his time. And he he's a proven winner. Like, look at what, where Chivas is at right now without him. Right? They're not doing well. Um, you know, San Jose's not doing well with him. But obviously the team you have at Chivas between and the team you have at San Jose not even comparable at this point. Mm-hmm. But I think... You know, I think he knows, even if, let's say, you adjust, right, to something that better fits this team for this season, just to try the best, to get the best you can out of them, you still know what kind of caliber player they are, and you'll know at the end of the year whether you want to get rid of them or not. Right. Just, I don't think you necessarily need them to jam into your, because this is the problem that Jason Christ had. Right with all these teams in MLS that it didn't quite work out after, you know RSL, he kept trying to make everybody fit his system and it just didn't work. No, you have to look at okay, what system is the best for your guys? What's the best for the players you have? Then, if you have a system that's different than that, you've got to at least find some middle ground while you get a transfer window or so, or even off-season, to get in the players that will fit better towards your system. You can't fit all of these square pegs into round holes out of the gate, especially if you're trying to get success early and at least somewhat often. Yeah, certainly. You know, it looks like Almeida's just... Again, trying to to get... He's saying, just trust me. We'll figure this out. They'll figure it out. They're professionals. You know, at some point, you know, you should uh, be able to man mark and all that stuff. But just uh, you have to hope that the brass in the front office 
has patience because there's a reason why they've switched so many coaches in what two and a half years. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I, I think you need to be careful about that if you're Matias Almeida. I think he'll make it through this season as long as they don't lose as many games as last year. I think if they, like you said, that little bit of improvement, if they can do that, um, they'll be he'll be okay. But I'm sure the fans will vocalize their displeasure, which. You know, isn't anything necessarily new, but yeah, you know, uh, that that will that storyline is going to continue. And another team that we that had been going down that road, uh, New England Revolution, they finally got their first uh, win of the season. Uh, Brad Friedel, you know, went on and talked about how MLS does not give you the same sort of feeling that you do in other places where there's no relegation. There's nothing oh. to punish you necessarily for losing. Oh. And uh, the team responded, and they they provided effort. Those two goals that they scored were on effort, especially the last one for the win, just right at the tail end, just being able to poke it in there after. It looked like it was... That, that pass was not going to get to feet, and it did. Um, I think you got to give uh, New England credit for that in in winning there. And, hey, you know what? Sometimes you got to say negative stuff uh, about the league, about the team, whatever, uh, to, you know. You just have to be very careful what fires you stoke. I get what he said. I get that it worked. But everybody's in this whole big debate with everything in the landscape of soccer with MLS now, with plans of what's going on over the next five to ten years, that whole mindset so you don't want to unintentionally start or continue debates while you're going for something in the moment like he was yeah I mean certainly not but you know I think still the team went out there responded he said he was happy with the way they played, I think you have to be. Um, oh, yeah. You know, a Minnesota United team that has been, you know, pretty decent this season. Uh, you know, yeah, you give away a penalty, sure. But, again, uh, for Baye to go in there in the second, 62nd minute, score on the goal he did, uh, you score er, you know, score first with Anibaba, I think that's uh, a good showing for New England. Right now, they needed that. They, I don't think you could afford to go another loss and then have more questions of Brad Friedel and everything else. And we'll see if this kind of lifts the weight off the team's shoulders and kind of lets them be a bit more free. But I, 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 I think that's still good, though, that they went out and that's what he was asking for. He wanted effort. He wanted to see them grind more and go out there and I think that's exactly what you got from that team yeah and that's exactly what you needed which in this case it was great this was a team that to me finally looked like they cared and I've only seen that in fits and spurts and that's been a model like with the organization that I've talked about Maybe this could be a start of something. Maybe this could be that slow build back to revolution, greatness, and dominance. Who knows? But the step one is showing, hey, we can give the effort. Now it's getting that effort out of them consistently. Certainly. And, hey, so far, D.C. United, first place in the East. Uh, thanks in large part to Wayne Rudy and a ridiculous Olympia golazo. I off, mean, uh, <laughs> I, I saw that and I had to see that like three, four times. It's like, did that really, 
No, we couldn't have. Oh, it had to take it to foot. No, it didn't. But it just, man, Wayne has still got it. This is the Wayne Rooney I was expecting to see. Now, it's really up to Ben not to screw this up. I'm not keeping my hopes up by any stretch of the imagination, especially because this is another time that Orlando has burned me. But uh, I'm seeing some things, and I might be liking those things. Hey, so far, four games undefeated. Yeah, four down, what, 30 to go? <laughs> this yeah, is still... I- this is still Ben we're talking about. At any point, anything can happen, and it can go south. Also, for me, that was definitely a foul that set up the... You can't go as hard as Dom Dwyer did. Rooney has to leap out of the way. Yeah, did he Did he maybe make a little bit out of it? Sure. But... He was going hard for him, and he that looked like it could have been dangerous had he not moved. I think yeah. it wasn't a bad goal to call that a foul there. No, I was looking at that, and like that seemed legit because there's only so many things that could have happened with that content or with that contact going the way it was. It would have been even more dangerous and had potential for disaster had Rudy tried to avoid it. Or had something happened? No. At that point, you just take it, good foul, and the rest from there is history. What did you think about, I mean, this was the battle of your two teams here. I mean, what what did you think about Orlando? Obviously, Dom Dwyer got a goal, which was uh, good to see. Still not seeing a whole lot from Nani, though. And the team did look better once Chris Mulder came on, but... I feel like that was a bit more, not just him, but more of a tactical change that, you know, coach made and everything. I just, I wonder if he just not figured out who, you know, the the, the best starting 11 for him yet. If you're going with this kind of like a 3-5-2-ish whole situation, yes, I'm Thankful it's not jamming everybody and forcing into the diamond. Thankfully. But it's like we talked about. It's trying to force and see what's what. Maybe you've got a good starting 11, but this isn't optimal. I don't know. I just I think, you know, for me, the way Nani always worked the best was sort of having him in like that 4 3 3 where he's coming from the wing side and then you're getting him and Muller or someone else trying to put balls in for Dwyer, um, you know, or someone else. I, I don't know. I think you need to find something that fits his style more to get him going. Uh, I know not everybody comes in the league and does wonderful. Right. Um, M- but maybe still. the... I've always been a fan of the 4-3-3. Maybe that's not a bad idea. Maybe that's something that they should explore. I would object to it. Because a guy with Nani and his crossing skills, like you say, and have even Dwyer as a guy up top, like you had in the past, like a 4-5-1, you could make that work. You really could. Obviously not an optimal start for Orlando. They do have one win, uh, and but they're, they're technically in playoff position right now because there's a seventh team that now goes to the playoffs. But anything else you see out of uh, Orlando that you go, man, they could be doing this better? Or... Mainly just formations a little bit easier in defense because – I think they sometimes wait and sit too deep and try to get stuck in where they could play a little higher and try to work with simpler tackles and pushing the ball forward. I think they do play better when they sit a bit deeper. I don't think they need to go full forward, but it could be just not too deep. No, it don't have to go like very high, high pressing line, but it's just if you're going to sit that deep, that's great, but you've got to be very careful in how you mark and do this and that because 
you don't even when you're sitting that deep, you're inviting yourself an absorbing pressure. Good teams will take advantage, carefully wait, pick out their spots, and score. So it's they're close. I'm not gonna say they're terrible. They're very close to getting it right on that part of the pitch. Just to sort of put a bunch of things in one here. Carlos Vela got that big hat trick on three out of the five goals on San Jose, and one of them was an absolute just beauty turn and shoot in the top corner. Oh, that was uh, amazing. And then you had Sporting KC putting seven goals on Montreal, who I think just quit after about the second one. Uh, Nemeth got a hat trick there as well. Uh, he's up to four goals um, on the season, along with that Memo Rodriguez from Houston. Also keeps adding to his goal tally uh, with a fantastic pass in from Albert Elise. He has, now has four goals, and this is a young, homegrown kid playing for Houston at 21. Slaton gets two goals. He's up there on four goals so far. Um after having to sort of grind it out with Portland, who probably had one of their best showings uh, on this season. Uh, to me, I think both those penalties were penalties for Slothan. Um And I, albeit, yes, he's Slothan, and he knows how to make a meal out of anything. But, uh, you know, sometimes the star gets the call, as you would say. And I don't know, who do you think uh, looked the best out of these four teams, for me, I feel like LAFC is just the I think best team right now. This is going towards the battle of LA. Right now, with the Galaxy, they've mainly been, as they should, running through Zlatan. But when you have a team that's knowing that they're in a tough stretch like Portland, they will do what it takes to try to grind out results, so you really have to put them to the sword. Zlatan did, the rest of the team didn't. And with sporting, that was just insane. I, You said it yourself, Montreal, after a while, they were just like, we know we're not coming back. We're really kind of defeated. That was a very atypical sporting performance. No but- either. That makes a difference for Montreal. Right, so with that one, you're like, okay, what if, dot, dot, dot. But LAFC, it's like, if you were to pick one of the LA teams that really has a model of unfinished business, Carlos Vela and LAFC are really playing like it. They're putting together the more complete performances. Vela's like, yes, I am here. I play here too. Let me show what I still have. Who knows? Maybe they could be the team for years to come, but at the very least right now, they're looking like we want to be title contenders. Yeah, I mean, team with the most points in MLS right now. I mean, that's also with some of the teams also having a game in hand, but still, um, they are, are looking really good. Carlos Vela leads the golden boot race right now six goals and dude is just hit on all cylinders he could possibly be up for that all-time goals and assist combined goals and assist record uh in one year for mls if this keeps going for him i think he definitely has a shot at that but i it's put seven goals for sporting kc on anybody that's that's tremendous after uh, knowing that you have the big game with Monterey in midweek, I think that puts you in a lot of confidence to go into, uh, go to Mexico and perhaps do what Toronto did and and put a surprise in there. I, I think when we come Thursday, I think we might see Sporting. You know, deliver deliver something unexpected because it's not like Monterey's been that good this season either. They've been kind of flaky. Sitting, you know, middle of the pack, trying to make a Leo push in the get MAX, and who knows? Maybe this is that time where they get that boost, 
sporting can pull off something, I'm giving them a puncher's chance. Yeah, and then going to sporting on the back end, that helps them a lot. And it's tremendously because when you see a team playing like as free to where they don't have a whole whole bunch to lose in which in this case sporting doesn't because let's face it with the Mexican dominance but also having in this case for the tie second leg at home it's like well we know we have to take care of business there let's just go all out and hey maybe going down and scoring two one or two give yourself a good result and say well we don't need to do all of this at home. That makes it even better. I would say watch out for Houston, though, with Rodriguez scoring the way he has, and you have the uh, Albert Elise um, there, and just that team is, is playing really well right now. Um, if they can keep this up, I think they're going to be one of those dark horse teams you got to be careful of uh, when it comes to the uh, Western Conference and maybe MLS Cup as a whole. Uh, you know, Sounders, uh, they drew uh, in their game this week. So, you know, Rachel's not here to talk about it. But, you know, still good showing so far from the Sounders as, as far as that goes. So they're they're doing their thing. And uh, still one of the best teams in, in MLS so far on the young season. Would definitely like to see more of a nil, more than a nil nil against a Vancouver team, but it's uh, Cascadia, so I guess you give it a little bit of pass. Yeah, it, it, those Cascadia results always intriguing, and the one thing I will say, it's early in the year. We all know any time you have a Cascadia match come once you're getting into the summer. With the weather, and while Seattle's hanging on now, Portland, once they go back home and play that tremendous home stretch, if they can be treading water and catch fire, anything could be up for grabs. Certainly. Uh, Just wrapping it up here. Philadelphia beat Cincinnati. Marco Fabian, David Akam combining for the goals. David Akam really has looked better. Uh, since making that move to Philadelphia. Um, Columbus still doing their thing. Uh, you know, that, we talked about Atlanta's woes, but Jesse's art is again on the score sheet. That dude can't stop for Columbus. He's doing fantastic there with Caleb Porter. Um, the Red Bulls also have looked really bad. Uh, they got beaten by an own goal. <laughs> and FC Dallas is just been doing their thing with Lucy Gonzalez and putting in the young players. Carlos Gureso got in a really early goal that kind of set the tempo. Real Salt Lake fought back, but I was really, really happy to see uh, Pombikal, who uh, he could star for U.S. Under 20s. Uh, keep out, keep watch for Pombikal. This uh, not just for the U.S. but what he's been doing for Dallas has been fantastic. Of course, Jesus Ferreira. Mr. Uh, son of David Ferreira doing his thing. He set up the goal for Gressel. He got the uh, goal in the 69 man for Dallas there um, to kind of put things away. Really like what I'm seeing. It's a different sort of setup with Lucy Gonzalez trusting. I mean, you know, the previous coach already kind of had that play the kids mentality. Um he still kind of went more veteran at times, and I feel like Lucci's just letting it all hang out with uh, the kids, and I really like seeing that. And so far, it's paying up dividends uh, for them. And I think overall, the things we've been seeing, one of the major themes so far out of the first five weeks is we're seeing a lot more production out of the younger players, um, oh. more homegrown younger players, along with some of these, uh, you know, the big international talents and everything else. You know, so I think that's a lot to be said for how the league is growing. Exactly, and this is kind of what MLS's initiative was. If you want to be one of the top ten leagues in the world, 
as you set for yourself. You can't just have your senior teams really doing all the work. You have to have the academies. You have to have the reserves. You have to have the ability to find, scout, grow, and develop these young players into your own. And MLS is really, as a whole, starting to get that message. And this is going to be the way, and you're going to see more of this. I still would like to wonder what exactly is still going on with all these red cards, but hey, now that it's April, maybe that settles down. Who knows? Uh, you can claim that headbutt wasn't intentional all you want, but just don't do that. Just don't. It's, it works out better for you that way. Uh, so, yeah, I think that's going to do it for us as far as uh, the show today goes. We'll be back on Thursday night, of course, talking about the Sporting KC uh, match at Monterey and also the U.S. Women's National Team game. Uh, Rachel will be back for that. I hope everything goes well with her for her to, you know, be in the mindset to want to do the show. Um, but if you like what you heard, uh, Monday is our normal spot for shows when there's not international games uh, happening. Although we might go to Tuesday next week because uh, the final U.S. Women's National Team game, or I don't know, actually no, never mind. We're still we're gonna stick to Mondays. We just won't do a after the game uh, review. We'll just do that for Monday night because the game is that Sunday, the seventh. So, uh, but even then, if you, if you like what you heard, we're available everywhere. There are podcasts, pretty much. You know, Spotify, iTunes, Stitcher. We're on YouTube as well. Uh, you can go subscribe to the W Two Network channel, and you get. Uh, us there and get all the other podcasts that are part of that and you can always just subscribe on your favorite podcatcher soccer to the max that gets every time we do a show it goes immediately into your feed so you know uh if you listen on the last word radio pretty much as soon as i post this i post it on there um so if you subscribe through there uh you're not you're not like waiting a whole day you're getting it almost immediately but again the best way to get everything we do, W10 Network, W2Net.com, and of course, just Soccer to the Max. Uh, well, for Eric and myself and Rachel, we will see you next time. Later, everybody. Peace!